Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome you again to a continuation of this fabulous series with Dr. J. Smith concerning the uh, problems uh, with the Quran. Primarily, we're focusing on external problems related to the manuscripts. Last time, we talked about one of those early manuscripts known as the top copy, and we showed why the top copy is not actually one of the Uthmanic copies that supposedly were disseminated by Uthman uh, uh, to the different provinces in his days. And we showed that the variance uh, in the dating. And also at the same time, we talked about some of the variant, uh, variance in within the text itself as it compares to the 1924 Cairo edition. Today, we're going to start with another one of those early manuscripts known as the Samarkand. Dr. J, welcome again. And please take it uh, from here. Well, the Samarkand is also one of the, probably the most famous one. It was brought to London when I was there a few years ago as an example of an Uthmanic recension. No doubt about it. It was, it, even the British didn't even bother to try to critique that. They just put it out there. Uh, those from Tashkent wanted them to say that, and so they did. And But when you look at it, you can see, if you look on the slide, you can see it's a monumental text. It's a, a, Monumental means it's a large, large writing. That's right. And there's only very few lines per page because it's so large. Uh, this was borrowed from the Christian scribes at that time who were in the 8th century were actually doing this, late 8th century. So uh, some people even would say that this is a much later uh, manuscript. Because the idea is the larger it is, the later it is. Yeah, that's right. Now, yeah. Alta Kulich, since we're going to use the Muslim scholars, Alta Kulich, he believes that it is uh, uh, an early 8th century manuscript. That's correct. Dates it from the 8th century. And he says that there are a number of reasons why we need to, this needs to be discredited. He says that, first of all, it has undisciplined spelling. It has different writing styles. It has scribal mistakes. It has copious mistakes written by someone with very little experience in Arabic with later editions. Only, and it goes only goes up to Surah 43. So Alta Kulich is very clear that there are real, real problems. He said, don't even use this manuscript anymore. Basically, he's turned his back on this one because it, ha it is so problematic uh, concerning its authority and also its content. Now... Even when you look at those 43, those 43 uh, chapters, what's fascinating, there's only one of those chapters that is really complete. 24 of them within the 43 are partial, right. and 18 don't even exist at all. So even the 43%, the 43 men are there, uh, are not the Quran, much of the Quran. They're with only one surah that's complete, that's surah 6. And Dr. J, I wonder how many Muslims even knew that it's incomplete? Until we brought it up today, uh, until people are not hearing. That's why it's important that we do bring this up. Okay. That's why I'm so glad you're doing it on your show. Because the more that Muslims realize that much of what they've been saying is just based on error. And much of it, it was not intentional error. It's just people have never done this work of studying it. And that's why I'm so I'm so glad these two, not only Turkish scholars have studied, but people like Franco Doroche has studied it as well. Correct. Now we get to the Ma'ilm uh, manuscript. And this is the one that is there in London. Uh, so I have seen this many times. I have taken people on tours on it. We go down and you can see it. It's on display. Uh, last I was there in July of 2017. It was on display then. And you can see immediately when you look at it, this is different now. Can you notice that the script is different? That's right. And the reason why we call it Ma'il, it's slanted. It's slanted. That's what Ma'il means in Arabic. Right. It, you can see it. It's slanted a bit to the left. And it also is not nearly as stylized as the Kufic that we had been That's looking correct. at earlier. That's correct. Because of that, you can you would say that this is an earlier, a cruder text, uh, much more rudimentary text. It's there in the British Library. But when you look at it, you will see it also, like the Samarkand, only goes up to Surah 43 in a Hijazi script, Ma'il Hijazi script. Uh, it includes, therefore, only 53% of the Quran. Now, there has been some uh, debate as to the dates on this. Alta Kulich and Ekmilin Sanlu, who had access to these six manuscripts for five years, Correct. between 2002 and 2007, they date it to the early 8th century. But he doesn't say how he came to that conclusion. Dr. Martin Lynx, who had responsibility for this manuscript for many years, he was the curator for the British, Muse uh, British Library, it used to be the British Museum, uh, he dated it to the late 8th century, to around 790. So he disagreed with Alta Kulich. So you can see there's disagreements by the scholars, and that's why it would be great if we were able to do that. Maybe you can do that in your research for your doctorate as to get a much more correct dating. A lot yet needs to be done. And then we get to the Al-Husseini manuscript, which is the one that's in Cairo. Uh, this is the one uh, that 
Uh, Another monumental text. Monumental. I mean, it's huge. Look, at you can see the picture on the left there uh, as those men are looking at it. It is huge. And that's why uh, there is a discrepancy on the date for this one. Altakulic and Ekmelin and Sanalu, the Turkish scholars, date it to the 8th century. Franco Doroz dates this to the 9th century. He says this is even later than that. Now, again, because of this discrepancy, it's hard to date manuscripts unless you're given access and you're able to do forensic testing on them. But what you will know is when you look at this, if, according to Alta Kulic, he says very clearly that it is not Uthmanic, okay? That's very clear. It is dated to the mid-8th century. It was stated that the Cairo copy might have been written on the order of the Al-Azib Ibn Marwan. Excuse me for my pronunciation. Abdul Aziz Ibn Marwan. There you go, the yeah. governor of Egypt. However, the reason for reaching this conclusion has not been explained. And this is what's so frustrating in this kind of work. You have reference after reference of people who just make claims out of thin air, but they don't support or subs uh, subs uh, do any uh, type of testing or giving any type of criteria as to why they came to those conclusions. That's right. And that's why it's important that we do have the scholars start to get a much more solidified uh, answer, and that's where we're hoping you're going to come in in the years to come. When you look at it, just take a look at this. He, Franco Doro says this is a monumental text, but take a look carefully on the picture on the right. Look at the blue arrows. What do you notice there? We're noticing some erasures, basically. Something was erased, or right. at least covered. These are coverings. These are yes. tapings that we're going to talk about that's later right. in probably the next episodes. These are coverings that are very damaging. Why were those coverings put there? It, it's obviously there is something in here that does not match you know, a certain reading maybe. At it that looks time. like they're trying to hide the text. Right. Earlier we talked about how Uthman burnt the manuscripts that That's disagreed. Right. That's right. In this case, you can't burn them because these are official texts. These are the texts, these are the codices of the caliphs. You dare not burn them. So what do you do? Whenever you see a discrepancy, you cover it over. And they take a look. I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven coverings from my position here, seven inches on one page. That's right. Now that's human uh, intervention, is it not? Absolutely, and also what is so interesting is it appears that there is a separation, at least from here, separation between two maybe chapters, and you can tell it was even added later because it's over some of the letters. It's over the letters, yeah. Right. That would be probably a verse for, you, for, a verse for the complication. <laughs> now we get to the Parisino Petropolitanus manuscript. That's a mouthful, I know. Uh, mm. it's, it's in Paris, it's in the Bibliothèque Nationale there. And when you look at it there, you can see it's a very rudimentary text. Um, it has, it had, it, with, with between two pages you can see with next to each other, there's a completely different script. And it seemed like some scripts were erased and written over. Ah, we're going to be getting to that. Yeah. Hold on to that. We're going to be talking more about that, uh, in, possibly this episode or maybe another one. Now, what does Franco Doros, this is the man that really doesn't own it, but he is responsible for this so he's done the most work on it, just like Alta Kulic and Ekmelin have done the most work on the top copy. Right. He is the one that's responsible for this text. He says there are corrections to the text. He disagrees with the 1924 Kairing Musaf. That's the official text that we use today, uh, the canonized text, in 93 places. But that's only 93 places that, that only makes up 26% of the Quran. That's the largest piece of the Petropolitanus manuscript is the Arab 328. Only a quarter of the Quran is in that. So it's not the whole Quran. The Arab 330G is only 15% of the Quran. And the Arab 614A is only 4.2. These are the three largest portions of this manuscript. So even the best of them doesn't have more than 26% of the Quran. Have you noticed we haven't found one Quran yet so far that is complete? Not yet. Not one. Now, if you want to look at some of the differences, uh, let's on the screen there you can see there is... Uh, Surah 14, Ayah 37. Why don't you read it, and then I'll read the Kyrene text, and let's see what's different. So in uh, the uh, Petropolitanus uh, one, it says, uh, Our Lord, I have settled some of my descendants in an uncultivated valley near your sacred house, our Lord, that they may establish prayer and, and make hearts among the people inclined towards them. This is Abraham talking here. Okay, that's the Petropolitanus. Now, the Kyrene text says exactly the same team until you get to the last sentence. Instead of, and make hearts among the people inclined towards them, it says, so make hearts among the people inclined. So here now you have a, a you, mu you must do it. Therefore, because There's an of this, expectation. There's an expectation. First one is just a prayer. And now you can see that that has huge difference. That's right. It is... Uh, 
if this is a perfect and unchanged Quran, why do you have these two variants, these two variations? The difference is subtle, but it is different. And I, a reading. And I tell you why, because obviously the shape of the fa in the so and the wow in the and looks the same. So they probably didn't know if it was a fa or a wow. They took a guess. That's right. And as you can see, they guessed wrong. If it was so, memorized, why would they guess? If the repent, because the repentance of the people is no longer a result of Adam setting people near God's sacred house that we see in the Petropolitan manuscript, but instead the repentance is something Abraham is requesting of God as a result of his actions. According, that's why the word so. So you can see, theologically speaking, that has implications. You could probably do a whole thesis just on that one yeah, verse. Very true, very true. Now, we then now come to the last one, and this is the most exciting. Well, exciting in that it's the latest one. Exciting in that it was it was kind of discovered by accident. It and looks like an Indiana Jones ones. type of thing. That's correct. And exciting because of what we're finding about it. Because this is the manuscript that many of us scholars believe is the oldest. Correct. This is by far the most important. The Sana'a uh, found in Yemen. And there you can see pictures of it. Now, these are my pictures, actually, the two on the left. Uh, I went to see Dr. Garrett Prynne, one of the first scholars to go down, to fly down in 1981 and to film it. And mm -hmm. as he filmed it, uh, and put it on microfilm along with Dr. Golig, uh, Oleg and Dr. von Bothmer, both, all three of them from Saderland University in Saarbrück in Western Germany. Mm -hmm. They were flown down because when you look at it, you can see, there are, do you see any diacritical marks on those? Uh, no. No. Do you see any vowelization? No. No dama, no kasra, mm -hmm. no fata? Not at all. None of that, right? Uh, you, in fact, you don't even see versification. There's no verses. It, uh, it, what's fascinating because if you look at the left-hand picture, at the, on the right-hand page, right-hand side of the left-hand picture, you will see there's a yellow mark. See the yellow mark there? That's right. So that's Surah 19. And then where that yellow mark is, it jumps to Surah 22. It's not in the same order as today's Quran. What happened to Surah 20, uh, 19 and 20? I'm sorry, Surah 19 in on top one, then it jumps to Surah 22. What's happened to 20 and 21? Correct. Well, 20 begins on the left-hand page. Left -hand page. Now take a look at it carefully and look at the script between the left-hand side of the page and the right-hand side of the page. There is differences in style. I can see one page has longer than the others, and that's just among just few that I can see from here. Between two pages, you have two completely different scripts. That's right. According to Dr. Ger Puin, the right-hand page, right-hand side of the page where the yellow mark is, is dated to 705. The left hand is dated to 60 to 70 years later. Wow, so we have in the same, just two pages, difference in time. A, a good half century. That's right. Now, that's what he said orally. He has not published this, so, I, so we need to be careful because we cannot support that from any published material that has yet to that's come correct. out. That's correct. And that's why also, if you look at those orange marks, every time you see an orange mark, that's a manuscript variant. But what, I, what, what is fascinating is that this is proving to be pr very problematic. Karns Heinz Oleg says the Quran began to be compiled in the last two decades of the 7th century, that's the time of the Malik, with other versions continuing until the 9th century, his conclusions. Gerd Prynn on the sauna, specifically on this manuscript, says the, it is the oldest parchment in papers of any Quranic manuscript. He's saying that. And I agree with him that he's probably correct on that. Yet more than half of the text is ambiguous letters which need diacritical marks for understandings. You've already talked about that. Adding vowels help correct mistakes. Changes in orthography, conventional spelling system of, of a language, are found in geographical tradition schools. And that's what you're going to be doing more on your doctor later, looking at those, some of those schools. So let's look at some of these changes. But we don't have to do it right now. We can do this in the next episode. I think that will be a teaser that we are going to look in the next episode, basically, about some of those erasures, uh, coverings, uh, coverings and writing over, and many other uh, corrections that took place. And keep in mind, Muslims think the Quran is preserved, it's perfect, nothing has changed in it. Now, Abdul, just thinking what you just said, let's look at some of these changes. That is probably the most difficult thing for Muslims to hear. Absolutely. Because they have claimed it's eternal, sent down, complete and unchanged, those four things. That's correct. We've said this from the very first episode. What you're now saying is, wait a minute, there are changes. There are changes. Substantial changes. And if that is so, that destroys eternal, that destroys sent down, and it destroys complete, and it destroys unchanged. Though, I mean, almost in one fell swoop. And it proves it's a man-made book. Human, intentional, 
changes. Absolutely. Okay, that's a great way to end off, boy. Very good. Well, thank you so much again, as always, for this uh, great contribution and for this uh, research. And I hope our audience will benefit a great deal from this. And we encourage them, as always, to share it with their Muslim friends. That if you're a Muslim, uh, uh, basically, viewer, please go and investigate the truth so that the truth might set you free. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe so that you don't miss future videos. And please consider becoming a patron on patreon.com forward slash International.